Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Beloved brothers and sisters, this evening we will require a lot of concentration because we are going through one of the most important incidents that occurred in the history of Islam. And this is the first major battle that took place between the Muslims and those who had oppressed them for so many years. And as we had said, from the moment of revelation, 14 years later to the day is when the Battle of Badr took place. So if we say revelation was on the 17th of Ramadan, we find this the 17th of Ramadan, the Battle of Badr took place. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. Remember, oppression will not last forever. Those who oppress, one day they will have to pay. And one day they will be within the clutches of the same people whom they have oppressed. And this is the sunnah. This is the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah protect us from oppression. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who can be concerned about our own weaknesses. And if we want to concern in the lives of others, it should be how to uplift them rather than how to drop them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. As we had made mention of there was the battle of the Ashira where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had heard that Abu Sufyan who was one of the leaders of Quraysh had taken a lot of the wealth of Quraysh, the wealth of the Muslims as well, who had left Makkah to Al-Mukarramah. There was a time when the Kuffar of Quraysh had usurped the wealth of the Muslims and anything that they left behind. They put it together, they made up these caravans and they went in order to deal with the people in Asham or the Syrian region, which includes Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, that entire region in the northern part of the Arabian Peninsula. So when the Prophet ﷺ heard of this, he went out with many of his companions and they tried to get hold of the caravan of Abu Sufyan and they only found that they had missed it and it had gone up already. So he returned to Medina Munawwara after some time and he started planning. And the planning was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa ta had already informed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we will grant you victory. We will grant you one of the two victories. So either you will have the caravan or you will be victorious over Quraysh. This was a promise by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what had happened, amazingly, it was a blessing that that caravan had passed. After some time, the Prophet ﷺ went to one or two other places with a few of his men. And the Sahaba anhum were not made aware of the fact that an army was being prepared to get the same caravan on its way back. They were not told the details. And this was one of the beauties of Rasulullah wasallam's system and style, which was divine given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He did not used to inform the people of the details because it would be very easy for people to find out. If I were to keep it within myself, I know no one knows. The minute I trust a person with it, perhaps many others would know. Well, nowadays we have a sickness. You know, when someone tells you something, when you really want the news to fly, tell them, don't tell anyone. That little statement, don't tell anyone, what it does is, it makes us itch to tell someone. And when we tell someone, we have a password. What's the password? Don't tell anyone. And then we tell them. And they go and tell the whole world knows. And everyone is saying, don't tell anyone. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. Look at how we have degenerated. The best thing, if you don't want people to know, do not tell anyone. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. And may he grant us a lesson. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam began to prepare. And as they left al Madin al munawwara they were 313 men, according to the majority of narrations. Some take it a little bit higher to 340 and some drop it to 311. We would stick to the narration that is most common, 313 men. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went with them. Now, one might ask, why is there a discrepancy in the figure? It's very simple. Because when they initially went, there were quite a few. They were perhaps up to 340. But when the Prophet ﷺ got to a place uh, known as Bayt al-Suqiyah, just outside Madinah al-Munawwara, he stopped and the army camped there for a while. And as we mentioned yesterday, he vetted the people one by one. And he sent people back to Madinah al-Munawwara who were not fit to join him because they were too young perhaps, 
or because they had other duties in Medina, or because he wanted them to fulfill something in Medina to Munawwara. The example we cited was that of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. He wanted to go out. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, your wife is ill and sick. Ruqayya bint Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She is not well, you go back and you will have a full reward of every one of us that goes out. And on top of that, whatever the outcome is, you will be granted a full status of a person who took part in, in whatever we are going to take part in. And this is why if you open the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari and you find the names which are written of the people of Badr, he makes mention of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, although physically he was not there. That is because he was told that you will be considered as one of them. Subhanallah. So this we learn a great lesson from because we need to realize that sometimes there are certain things we have to take care of. At that time, it was not compulsory for them to have come out because the Prophet ﷺ made a voluntary announcement. Whoever wants to come out with us, we have this uh, something we'd like to do, inshallah, and so on. They knew that they went out on escapades, little platoons, little reconnaissance missions, as we made mention of, to gather a little bit of uh, intelligence and so on. So had they known that it was going to end in a full-fledged battle, there would have been nobody or very few in Medina Munawwara. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan. So these 313, they had left. When they left, they got to a certain point, as we said, and this was a place known as Bayt al-Suqya, just outside Medina Munawwara. As they camped there, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent two men. Go and find out how far these people are. Who? The caravan of Abu Sufyan returning from Asham. So the two who were Talha ibn Ubaidillah radiallahu anh and Sa'ad, Sa'id ibn Zayd radiallahu anh, these two, they had gone out and they saw this caravan. They sent back a message to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But Abu Sufyan had seen them and Quraysh was already very wary because they had had previous caravans where they had skirmishes with the Muslims. We made mention of them. This was not the first time. They were worried. They were concerned. And Abu Sufyan was extremely intelligent, a very, very wise young man, not as old as Abu Jahl and the others. He was wise, very intelligent. What he did is he understood that there are people spying here on us. And he realized that these people are from Medina. How did he pick it up? Look at the narrations, the intelligence of these people, very sharp people. He looked at the droppings of the camel. And he studied the droppings of the camel and he saw in it that the fodder that these camels have been fed with is only from Medina, cannot be from anywhere else. Amazing because they had in it some of whatever, you know, was only in Medina Munawwara, the produce, the leaves of the, the palm and so on, which you could not find anywhere else. Intelligent man. And he knew that now there is a problem. So what he did was also, he began the first thing that he started to do was he told his people we are very few in number the best bet is to change our path we change the road so instead of going close to Medina and as we are passing we will you know uh, use the normal road we rather go on the difficult road and the further road which is closer to the coast so by that time no one will be able to get to us and we will have conned them in the sense that they will come for us they will miss us completely in the meantime, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was informed that, look, we have seen these people and you can proceed. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam began to proceed. And uh, very importantly, with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we said, only 313 people after he had vetted whoever needed vetting and so on. And from amongst them, they had only two horsemen, only Two horsemen, and this is something amazing. The two horsemen, as Zubair ibn al-Awwam radiallahu anh, and al-Mikdad ibn al-Aswad radiallahu anh. These were the two horsemen, only two. And they had 70 camels with them, which were being made use of. They were sharing the camels. So one would ride, two would walk. Then from the two who walked, one would ride, and the other two would walk. And they continued in that way. They shared it so much so, that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself also shared the camels. 
Not that he was the leader, so he just sat on one. No, he sat on it. After some time, he gave the, the chance to Ali radiallahu an, who was with him, and so on. One narration says Abu Lubaba was with them, and he gave the, the, the chance to Abu Lubaba, and so on. As for Abu Lubaba al Ansari, when it came to a place known as Ar Rawha, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent him back to Medina Munawwara. For what reason? As follows. When they were leaving Medina Munawwara, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum, the blind companion radiallahu an, in charge of Salah and in charge of Medina. So he was basically responsible for what went on. But as they got to Ar Rawha, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent back Abu Lubaba and said, you will be the Amir in Medina for as long as I am away in this particular uh, escapade or in this journey. So Abu Lubaba al-Ansari radiallahu anhu, he had gone back. In fact, this was Abu Lubaba ibn Abdul Mundir. That was the one who went back and he was the one who was responsible in Medina Munawwara during the absence of, of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on that occasion. Now, as they had gone, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam divided the army into two major divisions. One was the Ansar, headed by Ali radiallahu anhu, he was given a flag. The color of the flag was black. And the other was Sa'd ibn Mu'adh on the other side, who was the leader of the Ansar. So Muhajireen on one side, led by Ali radiallahu an, the Ansar on the other side, led by Sa'd ibn Mu'adh radiallahu an, the two of them had black flags. And as for the general flag for all the Muslims together as an entire army, it was given to Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu and it was a white flag. As you know, we learned yesterday that the flag for the general army was always white. Why the black ones was to distinguish between the different battalions within the same army. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. Then on the right side of the army, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam put a Zubair ibn al-Awwam who was in the front with his horse. He had a horse. And on the left side, he put Al-Mikhdad ibn al-Aswad radiallahu an, who also had a horse. So these two horsemen were placed on either side of the army. And with those who were on foot, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam put Qais ibn Abi Sa'sa'ah radiallahu an. And the army progressed slowly but surely. They had with them uh, those who would uh, provide food and so on. And they ate from amongst the camels that they had. They would slaughter and so on. This was the norm at the time. And they slowly progressed, subhanAllah. In the meantime, you find Abu Sufyan very, very intelligently sent a message to Quraysh. What was the message? You see this caravan. All the leaders of Quraysh had had their loot in it. And they had sent Abu Sufyan with it going up to Asham. So he sent a message to say, your people's containers are at stake. I'm using today's terminology. You see, today you have a big container coming. And when someone says there's a problem with your container, ask the business people how they cannot sleep. May Allah safeguard us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Imagine all the wealth of all these people. And what happens? It is now at stake. From who? From Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions. But the Muslims were not looters. They were not people who were oppressors. They were going to get back their rightful property which was usurped from them in Mecca. We need to get this straight. Sometimes on a global level, the non-Muslims make it seem like the Muslims were greedy to fight or they really wanted all the loot and so on. It wasn't the case. These people were persecuted and killed for 14 years. Their wealth was taken from them. Everything you said, that same wealth, the property and so on, was used now in order for these people to become richer. That wealth belonged to us. Subhanallah. Nothing wrong in going to get it, even if it means to fight in order to get it back. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deeper understanding. So, the people of Quraysh, they were very, very upset, very angry. Abu Jahl and the likes made an announcement and the announcement was, come on, let's go out and protect our property. Number one, number two is we can go out with so much power that we will just destroy Muhammad and his companions all at once. 
Abu Sufyan already had had because now he sent his spies and he found out figures, he found out where they were, he found out the movements and so on. He knew exactly what was going on, what type of weaponry these people had, where they were, what were, everything he had found out. He had figured it out because the people of Quraysh were warriors. They used to fight anyway. But as for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was not a warrior and a fighter. No, he was made to go out to defend. And that is when he became the best of the lot because from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, divine revelation, he knew exactly what to do. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the people of Quraysh came. How many of them? When they left, it is reported they were 1,300 strong men when they left Mecca. The number dwindled, it came down, we'll explain how it came down. But when they left, they were strong men. From amongst them, they say 1,000 horses. And here we only had two horses, subhanallah. And they were well equipped. Abu Jahl was so excited, he said, we will go to Badr. And we will camp there because as it is, it's more like a holiday spot there. We're going to take young girls and women. We're going to take alcohol. We'll party there. We'll wait for these people. When they come, we will finish them up and we will sort them out. They were going to have a party because to them, it was a superpower against a force similar to the Goliath David scenario of many years ago. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deeper understanding. Dawood alayhi salatu wa salam. Allah says, Kam min fi'atin qaleelatin ghalabat fi'atan kathiratan bi'ithnillah. How many armies that were smaller have overcome armies that were huge by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these people had gone uh, in a great number. When Abu Sufyan was safe, he sent another message to Quraysh as they left. What was the message? Now you people can stay. And you people can go back because we are now safe and your property is safe. So it was good enough for them to say, okay, property is safe. Let's go back to Mecca. But no, they prepared so much. They had pride. They had this haughtiness. We want to wipe out these Muslims and we must sort them out. And Allah wanted something to come to pass as we will see. So now Abu Jahl says, no, we are not going to go back. But a few of the people decided, no, we want to go back. The, there is no point now in fighting. So if we take a look, Banu Zahra, they had came back. They, they had returned. So the, the numbers became smaller of the disbelievers. And from the very beginning, Abu Lahab was one of them who could not go. What had happened, all the leaders came out. Abu Jahl came out, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, Shayba ibn Rabi'ah. A lot of these top people, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, all of them came out, the leaders of Quraysh. Because they were so excited, we're going to wipe out the Muslims. And those who could not make it, they sent their family members and kith and kin to come out on their behalf, such as Abu Lahab. He couldn't make it on his own. And Abu Lahab fell very sick at some stage. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson. He was the one who used to throw, astaghfirullah, dirt upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He lost his health. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. Really. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us purity and to make us not from amongst those who blaspheme, to make us not from amongst those who earn the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are fortunate that knowledge is very easy nowadays. It's at our fingertips. It's not difficult to learn as it was many, many years ago because today we have access not only to the internet but to people. If you want someone to speak to them live, you don't need to travel for eight days and 16 days. You can pick up a telephone today. You can fly in eight hours and you can get to anyone on the globe to find out. Still, we are lazy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us earn the knowledge of deen and may he make us from those who understand and realize through the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Abu Lahab, he didn't come. And there was a clan that did not attend at all. Banu Adi, they just refused. They said, look, we're not interested in fighting from the very beginning. So now Banu Adi was behind in Mecca. Abu Lahab was behind in Mecca. And now Banu Zuhra, they decided to go back after Abu Sufyan sent the second note and the second letter. However, when Quraysh got close to Badr, they were insisting on war. We want to fight these people. Now it's no longer about the caravan. The caravan is gone, it's past, it's safe. Now it's about these people. We want to fight them. Now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did not want to fight. When he came out of Mecca, of, of Medina Munawwara, he intended the caravan. He did not intend a war. 
So what he did is he started asking the opinion of his companions. What do you think? Should we fight these people? And obviously there were two opinions because those who said we should not fight them, they were only concerned that, look, we are not heavily armed. We came out with just a few weapons. Each one of us has a sword. We have a limited number of bows and arrows. And at the same time, we came for a caravan which had in it just a few number of a few people. And now we are going to face the superpower of the time. And we are so small in number. So it's not like they wanted to run away. But they were putting forward a case to say it's not going to be worth it fighting. However, subhanallah, listen to what Al-Miqdad ibn al-Aswad radiallahu anhu says. He was one of the men on the horse. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, should we go and fight these people or not? He says, O oh, Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we are not going to give you the answer that Banu Israel gave the Prophet Moses, Musa alayhi salatu wa salam, when they told him, اذهب أنت وربك فقاتلا إنا هنا قاعدون Go you and your Rabb and go and fight. We are sitting and waiting here. We are going to say we will come with you and we will fight. The decision is yours. You make a decision, we are with you. Subhanallah. So this was the difference. The companions of the Prophet Musa alayhi salatu was salam, they told him, you go and fight. We're waiting here. We don't want to tackle these jababira and these tyrants. You and your Lord, the two of you can go. A'udhu billah. So Al-Miqdad ibn al-Aswad says, we will not say that. We are going to say, the decision is yours. We are with you. Go and we are right behind you. Subhanallah. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turns to the Ansar. Why did he turn to the Ansar? It's important to seek the opinion of those who are warriors, those who are going to fight if we want to engage in a war. You need their opinion, not like today. Man makes a decision, the people on the ground have no say whatsoever. Half of them are so innocent, they don't even know why. Like the Prophet says, there will come a time, لا يدر القاتل فيما قتل ولا المقتول فيما قتل. There will come a time when the, the killer doesn't know why he is killing and the one who is murdered won't know why he was murdered. Go and ask the armies doing their rounds on the globe. Why are you doing this? They say, I don't know, we don't know. And ask the people who are killed, why are you being killed? They say, we don't know, we don't know. That is a prophecy of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said a time will come when people won't even know why they're doing what they're doing, but they will be spreading corruption across the earth. May Allah safeguard us. As for the Muslims, they sought the opinion of one another. Even Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, although the instruction was his and Allah had already revealed to him, but in order for us all to learn a lesson, as to the importance of seeking opinion, he asked the Muhajirin and he asked the Ansar. As for the Ansar, it was because he had a treaty with them to protect him in Medina. But he didn't have a treaty with them that they would protect him elsewhere outside of Medina Munawwara. It was important that he asked them the question, look, we are now heading for Badr. Is it possible that you people would like to fight with us? And Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, the head of Al-Aws, we mentioned his name so many times, the one who accepted Islam at the hands of Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu. Sa'd ibn Mu'adh says, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you came to us, we believed in you, we believe you're the messenger, we believe you are our leader, we have obeyed your instructions, we will continue obeying your instructions. You tell us what to do, even if you take us and instruct us to dive into the ocean, we will dive straight after you, subhanallah. Tell us whatever you want. We are with you. So what happened? That gave strength to the rest of them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this in the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how it would have been good if the Muslims had had the caravan, which was the easier one. But Allah says, we wanted something to happen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this so beautifully. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was favored. And Allah says, لِيَقْضِيَ اللَّهُ أَمْرًا كَانَ مَفْعُولًا All this was in order for Allah to make, to pass that which was meant to come to pass. Subhanallah. Allah says, وَتَوَدُّونَ أَنَّ غَيْرَ ذَاتِ الشَّوْكَةِ تَكُونُ لَكُمْ The beginning of that verse. وَإِذْ يَعِدُكُمُ اللَّهُ إِحْدَى الطَّائِفَتَيْنِ أَنَّهَا لَكُمْ 
وتودون أن غير ذات الشوكة تكون لكم ويريد الله أن يحق الحق بكلماته ويقطع دابر الكافرين When Allah had promised you that you will definitely be victorious over one of the two armies, you had intended, you had hoped that the easier one be yours, which means those who are with the caravan, small in number. You were hoping that that would have been the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had meant when he promised you one of the two. But Allah says, but Allah intended for you to go for the big one because he wanted to cut off the backs of the disbelievers, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Amazing. So this was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why Allah says, كَمَا أَخْرَجَكَ رَبُّكَ مِن بَيْتِكَ بِالْحَقِّ وَإِنَّ فَرِيقًا مِّنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ لَكَارِهُونَ Just as Allah removed you from your house in Medina to go out, Allah is the one who took them out to go to the battle of Badr. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and then you found that some of the believers were not really willing to fight. When? When they were asked, do you now want to fight or go back? As I told you, there were two opinions. They did not say we are not willing to fight because they didn't want to obey the instruction. If the instruction came, they would obey it. But they were asked for their opinion. And all they said is, we don't think it's a good idea because we are not as well equipped as the others. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُجَادِلُونَكَ فِي الْحَقِّ بَعْدَمَا تَبَيَّنْ كَأَنَّمَا يُسَاقُونَ إِلَى الْمَوْتِ وَهُمْ يَنْظُرُونَ They are arguing with you about the truth after it is made clear to them as though they are being driven to their death whilst they are watching. Look at the words of the Qur'an. Nobody is driving anyone to their, to their death. But it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There came after that the instruction of Allah to proceed to Badr. Everything was over. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. All of them proceeded. Unlike the disbelievers, when the letter came, some of them went back. With the mu'mineen, when the instruction came, 313 of them, they arrived. And they marched with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So... Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he got there, and as we made mention of what happened with Sa'd ibn Mu'adh and Al-Miqdad ibn Al-Aswad radiallahu anhum, giving the, the uh, backup and making statements that really empowered everyone and made them feel very high in morale. Because obviously when your leaders are saying, let's go, everyone else who is lower down feels very high. But if the leaders were slack and saying, no, we're not really so much for it, you find the little ones, they won't even want to, to take part. Not to say there were anyone who was actually little, but in comparison to the leaders and the leadership, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Introducing the One Islam TV app, the ultimate destination to learn about Islam with hundreds of educational videos, lessons, and documentaries. Experience our YouTube channels in one place. All content is music free. Download the One Islam TV app now from the Apple or Google Play Store today. Ooh.